Good evening, everyone who's joining us for the 10th and final webinar in our series here. Uh, we are going to be visiting the Tracy Morgan Gallery in Asheville. Uh, before I turn this over to Louise, I'll just remind people that we will have both a chat and a Q&A window open. The Q&A window is the best place to be asking questions to any of the panelists. The uh, chat window sort of works best for immediate uh, responses or if you're having technical issues that I need to know about, that's a good place for it. Uh, at the end of the session here, we will open up everyone's microphones for questions. So you can be typing questions in at any time during the presentation, or if you want to wait to the end and either write or voice your questions, you may do so. So let me turn the uh, mic over to Louise Glickman, who is the founder of Shack. Louise. Thank you. So welcome back, folks. Um, I am just so excited about the Tracy Morgan Gallery. And I have to admit, I've not been there. So my good friend, Jean McLaughlin, suggested that I get in touch with Tracy. <clears throat> and once I took a look at her gallery, oh man, I just so blown away. And this morning, I treated myself to literally an hour looking at the artists that she represents. Um, Tracy is a New York transplant, and her gallery appears to have the look and feel of a transplanted New York gallery. Uh, her background was in art history, and um, she has served as a gallery director and curator in a number of galleries that I imagine if any of you are New York art seekers have probably heard of Pace McGill, uh, Yancey Richardson, and also Barry Friedman galleries. And um, she brought her talent here a few years ago and, and here we are. I will also say that Bob and I are equally excited because not just because this is the last gallery tour and we can sleep tomorrow, that's not really it, but because we have had such a tremendous response. We've had a very, very active audience. We've had lots of good press. We've had lots of national participation and we now feel that Sand Hill Artist Collection is, is a reality. We have some credibility and we want to thank you all, most of all, who have stuck with us throughout. And uh, without any more, I would like to turn this over to Tracy and uh, hear what she has to say. Hey, all. Thank you so much for joining us this evening on our final of uh, the final gallery walkthrough. Um, I would, I'm thrilled to be participating in this and I'm so happy that Louise asked me to um, be a part of it. Um, a huge thank you to Bob and Louise for organizing this incredible programming over the last two weeks. You two have worked so hard and I hope you have a long vacation ahead of you. So um, a round of applause for you two for two weeks of this. Um, so um, tonight we will open with me just talking a little bit about the gallery um, and our, my history. And then we're gonna do a, uh, we're gonna cut to a video that was pre-recorded uh, just last weekend um, of our current exhibition, Life on Earth, Super Predator, Super Weed, Super Bloom. Um, I think I just said that wrong, but anyway. Um, so uh, my background, uh, I opened the gallery in uh, 2017, in, on January 2017. Um, I, uh, we focus on modern and contemporary artwork by uh, emerging and established artists from the United States and abroad. Um, my background, as Louise mentioned, um, I have about 25 years of gallery and curatorial experience. Um, I began my career in a really wonderful little gallery in West Palm Beach, Florida that's no longer open, but um, it was sort of like the museum that sold art. Um, and I moved from there to New York City where I worked, as Louise mentioned, um, at Yancey Richardson Gallery as a director, Pace McGill Gallery. Uh, I worked with Barry Friedman, among others. And then after 12 years in the city, 
my husband and I decided to move to Asheville, where we relocated in the fall of 2015, happily. Um, back to the gallery focus, uh, we uh, are sort of this white cube um, model of galleries. So we focus on one or two artists at a time and rotating exhibitions. We also do uh, group shows of probably one or two times a year. So they're very well researched, um, exploring historical and contemporary themes, one of which you'll see tonight. Um, our current exhibition is a group show. Um, we also have advisory services, I guess like all galleries. So we work with our clients from start to finish. If you come in and ask me if I have landscapes, then I'll show you all the landscapes and work with you on framing private viewings with artists, gallery, um, not gallery, I'm sorry, studio visits. Um, and then we'll also deliver and install the work for you. Um, and if you come in and our exhibition's not at all what you're looking for, um, then we're happy to talk with you about your project and your budget, pull a bunch of work for you to see. We have a big inventory. Um, I represent about 30 artists. And then I have work by other artists that I'm, I don't represent, but have work available by. So everything is on our website. Um, our prices range from about $125 to $25,000. So we try to have a little bit of something for everybody. Um, we have photography and video installation, textiles, works on paper um, by modern and contemporary artists. Um, so yeah, I guess without further ado, we will walk to the front and then um, we'll have Bob play the video for you. So if you bear with us. And while I'm walking up front, I wanna thank Matt Dunn, who is our videographer. So he's currently filming and he actually recorded the, the video that you're about to see. You can find him on Instagram at uh, the, the .matt finish. And um, Bob, if you'll take it away. Hi everybody, welcome to our virtual exhibition walkthrough of Life on Earth, Super Weed, Super Predator, Super Bloom. We're joined in the gallery today with artist and curator, Hannah Cole, who organized this exhibition. Hannah lives here in Asheville. She studied at Yale University and um, Boston University. Her work can currently be seen in this exhibition as well as front burner at the North Carolina Museum of Art in Raleigh. Her work has, she's had a solo show here at the gallery in the summer of 2019, as well as the Church and Center of Her Art in Boone, North Carolina in 2018. Uh, she's been exhibited widely in places such as the Drawing Center in New York City, University of Maine Museum of Art, and Boston University, among others. In addition to being an artist and a curator, Hannah is also a writer for Hyperallergic, and she is, has a tax firm for creatives called Sunlight Tax. Welcome, Hannah. Hi, thanks so much for having me here. So you came to me with this idea for this exhibition this summer, early this summer. Mm -hmm. um, can you tell us a little bit about how you came up with the idea and how you um, conceptualized the premise of the show? Sure. So um, it came about from a conversation I had with another artist in the show, Kirsten Stolle. Um, she and I are, because we both live in town um, and we have a lot in common, we're really good friends and we were talking, her work deals with Monsanto and corporate language and my work is about weeds. So we're standing here by one of my paintings um, called Persist Takes Up Space Turns Towards Light. Occasionally I forget my own titles. Um, and so I've been working with the, with the subject of weeds ever since I moved to Asheville, um, I've you know, tended to do sort of close-ups of urban landscapes. And the, when I moved here from New York City, the thing that struck me so much in Asheville was the green. And so like I went out and bought eight tubes of green, it was my first trip to the art store when I got here. So weeds have kind of like become my symbol and I'm thinking about them metaphorically as you know, a kind of nature that is not approved of um, and that they become a symbol of a lot of other things. Um, immigrants, women, people of color, things that are sort of told they don't belong in the normal space, in the normal sphere. So Kirsten sent me a definition. She was doing research for her work about corporate languaging. She sent me a definition of a weed from Bayer Monsanto. And this language was 
really incredible to me because it was so, it read like a Stephen Miller anti-immigration speech. It was really dark. It talked about um, undesirable and foreign invaders and things like that. Um, and I just saw that definition that she had sent me and I was like, oh my God, that's a show. Um, so Kirsten and I talked about it a little bit and it just kind of, that was the nub of it. Um, because to me, it brought in this element of language to an idea that I've been working on in my work. It also connected my work with Kirsten's. And I was just thinking about, um, you know, as you know, over the summer, um, not that this hasn't been going on forever, but we have had this national reckoning over race and the treatment of black Americans in particular. And um, so kind of thinking through those issues myself, and it felt like a zeitgeist moment of the nation thinking about those things. It felt like there, was these, there were these threads there between race and weeds, both of which have no basis in science, yet are you know, kind of thrown around like they're real, like they are scientific. So I liked that juxtaposition of race and weeds, and then I, I thought that this is a way to kind of expand this idea out into language and also into nature mm -hmm. um, to talk about um, fitting in, belonging, and how language can do this thing of bringing you close or pushing you away. Um, so that, that was kind of the origin. Excellent. Yeah. <laughs> um, so let's talk a little bit about the work in the show. We'll do a, a little walkthrough and Hannah and I will just talk about the pieces and why she included them and how she came about um, finding some of the artists. So some that I've known and some I've, I had ne not been familiar with, which is always exciting. Do you want to start with your piece? Sure, I would love to. So this is a fairly good representation of um, the kind of work that I'm making at the moment. Um, it's a weed poking through that has grown through a fence and I just I love you know I, capturing this moment of where it's filled with light and it's really beautiful um, so to me I'm always interested in finding beauty where others see ugliness um, which is why weeds are one of my favorite symbols um, and I made this and the the title persist takes up space turns to light is to me kind of sh twisting like this idea of an unwanted weed that somebody's going to come by and hack off with a weed whacker it's like this thing is thriving this thing doesn't care who thinks it's beautiful it is reaching towards the light so to me it's this really positive symbol and this this type of work was in hannah's uh, solo show it was all about the persistence of weeds and the title was turn to light mm -hmm. which was quite fitting and it was a gorgeous show which you can see on the website. Thank you. Um, <laughs> I also love the word persist because of Elizabeth Warren. Of so course. she turned she turned that word into a, a it's little a great trigger word. word for me. <laughs> so let's walk down to Kirsten's pieces. Yeah. So Kirsten, you know, she, we were having this conversation that started um, the idea for the show and what I love about Kirsten's work is how she takes the words from corporate annual reports and from their um, propaganda. And she kind of re recontextualizes the words and lays it on top of images that kind of show more of the real story. So um, this is, do you want to talk about the? This one is, uh, this is a series that Kirsten did called By, By the Ten, um, which was all about corporate greenwashing and um, their slogans to get you to buy their product even if they are pulling the wool over your eyes. So this one is um, called Feed, and uh, this was, I think, a, the picture, the photograph is a chemical plant in Montreal, which was a big, huge fire that um, was burning at the Monsanto chemical plant, I think in 1966. Um, so she took, basically, she took some archival pigment prints of chemical plants, and then she silk screened these propaganda slogans from Monsanto on top of it. So, of course, we have the second one, which is we pledge to be part of the solution, which is interesting because I think we all know they're probably part of the problem. <laughs> um, so this is, this is you know, indicative of what Kirsten does in a large portion of her work, not all of it, but a large part. So this is a great body of work. Let's go talk about Christina's piece. So I'll talk about Christina's um, because this was an edition that I had. Um, 
because we were kind of lacking the sort of Latino voice aspect in this exhibition, which was very important. Um, Christina Colon Munoz is a very young artist at Western Carolina University. Um, she is actually get, just getting her BFA now. And this piece is called Sueno Americano, American Dream. And she slip cast in porcelain three milk jugs, which represents sort of the disposability of immigration in Trump's zero policy, zero tolerance immigration policy. So what she's done is screen printed on each um, milk carton a deposition from a member of a family that was separated by these um, atrocious policies that were brought about. She used the milk carton, again, because of the disposability, but it also kind of harkens back to, our, to my childhood where you'd see missing people on uh, milk on the side of a milk carton. Um, so a very strong, very powerful voice from such a young person. Yeah, it is. And I just love how they seem like garbage and like cassette, but they're so beautifully made out of this precious material. It's got this real kind of tension in it, just formally. I love it. It's beautiful. And this is actually now in the collection of um, Western Carolina University, which is really exciting for such a young artist. Yeah, she's really talented. She is. Um, and let's talk about Sachiko's work. Yes. So this piece is by Sachiko Akiyama. Um, it is called Bird by Bird. Um, Sachiko is based in New Hampshire, um, and she, I have, I have admired her work for so long, and I met her finally after I was already an admirer when we were in a critique group together. Um, and her work has a lot of symbolism in it. It has a lot of kind of almost iconographic quality. Um, I happen to know that she looks at a lot of Egyptian funerary work. So it has this kind of solid, um, almost religious, spiritual kind of quality. That is something I've always loved about her work. Um, and a, a lot of her work deals with themes of home, finding home. Um, she had a show titled On Finding Home. And she uses a lot of different symbols. Um, here we've got a symbol of a boat. Um, kind of making reference to a voyage or to immigration, and um, also the symbol of the bird, which, um, and we'll see more birds from Sachi <laughs> <We will. laughs> in this show. Um, but birds migrate, and this is one of the kind of themes of her work. So I just, this piece I just find so strong and striking, and I love the way it it calls in other art historical elements like the Gothic arch and the, the niche in the wall. Um, meanwhile, it's also the artist's father. Um, so, and, and there is a personal element of her parents coming to the United States from Japan. Um, yeah, so. and I love the birds, how they come up and around the, the figure and then out the side, which has cast this gorgeous reflection on, on the white wall. So yeah. quite stunning. Um, so we'll go around the corner and see more of Sachi's work as well as uh, Ramiro Gomez. Fabulous. So this is Sachiko's work as well. Um, this is, I mean, it, it's an image of herself and her sister um, and I, I think of Sachi's work in this show as kind of a high point. Um, a lot of the show is about man-made divisions and then how nature transcends them. So to me, the, she, ha she is calling in all this imagery of nature. Um, here it's the mountains um, and sort of man's relationship to nature. Um, so I just, I just really love this piece. It's, um, I guess I want you to have your own reaction to it and not me tell you what, but I just, I think it is, uh, it speaks to me. It just, I find it moving. And again, she brought family into it because this, her sister is part of this piece as well, which is a, another mm -hmm. lovely piece that connects to the, her father in the boat. So. Absolutely, yeah. And behind you, we have another piece of Sachiko's um, 
which is migratory birds, which we'll see a little bit more of here in a few seconds. But mm -hmm. this is a woodblock print of Sachiko's of migratory birds. And I know that Sachi said that um, most migratory birds, um, they don't care who they migrate with, they all migrate. Is that, is that correct? I think, yeah. Yeah. Um, so we see different types of birds um, in this woodblock print, uh, which again brings that um, nature and immigration into play. Yeah. Just a sense of, of home and belonging and a kind of, I think also, you know, it, in Sachi's work, you're seeing kind of home, a, a very expanded idea of home. What is home? Um, yeah, I love it. I also love just on a technical level, the, the connection with the wood because she, I think if, if anybody knows Sachi's work, um, historically, she has sort of been a sculptor in wood, um, but she has, in the last five years, radically expanded her materials outward. But I love how the print is actually a woodblock print, so it has this wood carving element, even when it is not. Um, and this a one is lovely because this is wood and clay. Um, so she's working with clay and ceramics now as well, mm -hmm. I yeah. believe. Yeah. So. Yeah, and there's all kinds. The mountains behind, which are a part of the piece are also multiple materials. So there's wooden mountains and resin and cement. So it's just bringing all these different kind of elements together, so. And this piece is by Ramiro Gomez, and he's bringing another of the Latinx voice on immigration to the show. Um, most of his work, he deals with the unseen people, like the gardeners, the housekeepers, um, the nannies, that take care of all the pristine houses in Los Angeles. Um, so in this series, what he's done is super or painted uh, figures onto high-end magazine advertisements. So this one happens to be a Dyson vacuum cleaner, and he's painted the housekeeper into it. Kind of, again, bringing the unseen immigrant worker into our um, reality, into, back into the forefront of our mind. So this piece is by Antoine Williams. Um, I learned about Antoine's work because he and I are together in the show Front Burner at the North Carolina Museum of Art right now. So um, when I was in that show in Raleigh, there is a piece from this series, which is the Super Predator series. And I just had such a reaction looking at it because it's so beautiful. And I was really attracted to looking up close at it. It like pulls me in, but it also has this quality of being like skin in an eerie, a little bit frightening way. And then the, the title is kind of the kicker for this piece. So the title of this one is Portrait of a Super Predator who no one believes, so they said she was talking out the side of her neck. Um, I, in, his, um, in Antoine's work in this series, um, the titles have so much impact. It kind of like, to me, like shifts the way you view the work. So I love that word. I mean, I hate the word, but the word super predator is so loaded. But then the other side of the title has this like human quality and kind of like brings the other side of it in. So I really, really love that um, use of language as well as his like command of materials in, yes. in Antoine's work. It's really yes. incredible. It's amazing how he creates the appearance of human flesh um, with acrylic paint. Mm -hmm. And if you come, I mean, one of, this, is, this is why I love to come in to see work in person. And this is, you know, here we are in this world where a lot is through screens. But when you come up close to this work, there is so much incredible detail. There's thread in here. There's like bits of newsprint and, and you can see writing from newspapers and different colors. You can even see some chicken wire here. So there's just kind of a lot of juicy stuff to look at visually. It's really exciting, um, an exciting piece. Yeah. So um, right here on the floor, um, we have one of, I think, one of the more playful pieces in the show, um, a work by Susan Metrican. Um, is this one called? Nightcrawler. Nightcrawler. So it's a worm, <laughs> appropriately enough, on the ground. Um, and I think it's the artist's intention that you would actually sit on it. I'm not sure that um, <laughs> that's happening in the gallery. <laughs> um, but I just, 
I, I really love Susan Metrican's work. Um, it, it is very full of humor and life. Um, there's a lot of natural imagery and it kind of ties, it, 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 I think she takes a lot of domestic objects and then also items from nature like animals and is kind of pulling them together, morphing them in ways that you don't always, it, they sneak up on you, I think. So um, I just, I really love this piece. Um, I don't know if you want to talk, if we should talk about Susan, kind of her biography right, a little yeah, bit more. Right, yeah, because she's um, a Thai-American artist, correct? Yep, she is. So she has, her dad is Thai, and she grew up in Oklahoma, where there are, you know, like, real cowboys, right? Like, where she was growing up. And so, and I believe where she grew up was pretty rural. Um, and she was telling me about this experience in her life where she went to visit Bangkok, Thailand, as a tourist, I mean, she's an American in Thailand. Um, and she had this funny experience of noticing these like Buddhist guys, Thai cowboys, like with, with sort of um, like wearing Buddhist symbols, but also wranglers and like with rope. And there was this whole like <laughs> genre of Thai um, Westerns. And so for her, she really had this flipping back on itself kind of um, moment where like she's a tourist in Thailand but she's half Thai and she's seeing this thing from that could be from Oklahoma kind of with this Buddhist interpretation <laughs> so it was kind of like this like flipping in on itself kind of a thing and I think of her work as kind of relating to themes in that way of like taking symbols from cultural things you see all the time, like a Western, right. or um, so lots of rope or um, curtains or jeans. She has a lot of work that has denim in it. Um, and kind of using these symbols until they almost lose their meaning or it, it disorients you. It definitely brings a little bit more lightness to the show. Mm -hmm. A lot of the work is beautiful, but it also is heavy. Um, it's dealing with themes of immigration and race, um, and misogyny perhaps. Um, so Susan brings the nature and mm -hmm. the little playfulness, which is a nice um, equalizer. Absolutely, yeah. Um, so speaking of heavy and beautiful, <laughs> we can go to another piece of Kirsten Stolle's, which is entitled Chemical Bouquet 2. Um, do you want to talk about the piece? Sure. So Kirsten, you know, we started early in the show, um, the, you know, with the conversation between me and Kirsten, um, this work takes a bunch of basically the products of Monsanto or Monsanto Bayer since they merged um, and it's kind of meshing them all into this really beautiful like ornate Victorian still life except it's actually when you get up close they're very meticulously put together cut out pieces of um, images from catalogs and um, prints of the products of Bayer Monsanto. So we've got, um, what are the ones in this one? We have like um, corn, soy, cottonseed. Rapeseed. Rapeseed. Um, the plant that aspirin is derived from. Mm -hmm. uh, we have cow udders and syringes because of hormones they create for cattle, um, as well as Agent Orange. Yeah, <laughs> speaking of heavy. <laughs> so I like, I really love Kirsten's work next to Antoine's work mm -hmm. because um, in Antoine's work, it's sort of like taking some, something beautiful or um, you know, taking a human being and making it into a monster using language. Kirsten almost does the opposite, where she's taking beautiful language, but it's hiding something monstrous. Agreed. <laughs> And we'll go on to Antoine's other piece in okay. the show. So this is another in the Super Predator series. Um, this is Portrait of a Super Predator who was made to believe she was cute to be dark. Um, so it's just got that wonderful quality of his work. You can see all this detail, this writing, chicken wire, thread, lots of detail um, in this piece. I just, and also I love the bright color. The, the color is really spectacular. Really great, yeah. Next, we have Carly Glavinsky. Um, 
she has two pieces in the show, so we'll speak about one first and then go on to the floor piece. Mm -hmm. So do you want to talk about Carly's work? Sure. So um, Carly, um, she does a lot of very meticulous, careful work that is um, taking everyday objects in the world. And this piece is called Life on Earth, which is where the show title derives from. And in many ways, I think of this piece as kind of pulling the whole show together. Um, because after all, all of these things happen as, you know, life on earth. Um, the detail in this piece is really incredible. She's taken this book by David Attenborough, Life on Earth, um, and she has meticulously painted and recreated this book. And there's all these little, little incredible Easter egg kind of um, details on it. There's this little like rock crystal thing that is actually a sculpture sitting on top. There's this like wrapper or stick of gum here. And there's also, if you even look under the piece, she's sculpted and cast a piece of chewing gum, which she stuck to the bottom of it. So such a playful piece. it's like really, really playful and funny. And there's also like on the top of the cover, it says as seen on TV. Um, and then there's this like discount sticker, like it's from a bargain bin. So again, it's like, whereas in Christina's work, we're talking about like, you know, human beings being treated like trash. She's sort of, sort of twisting that in a more playful or lighthearted way. Like, you know, it's life on earth and it's in the bargain bin. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah. Um, the other piece by Carly um, is on the floor, which is a, I think, a, a very stunning piece. It's beautiful, but it has a lot of, um, there's a lot of heaviness to the backstory. Definitely. Um, I, so this piece is, um, it's called Pressing, and it is um, 22 Morning Glories mm -hmm. and nine Queen Anne's Lace, which just relating to the theme in this show about weeds they are not cultivated flowers they are technically weeds um, although again weed is a subjective part yeah, of the of point course. here is <laughs> that it's a subjective idea and they're really beautiful beautiful flowers who doesn't like a morning glory i know so happy um so there's really a lot of layers to this piece but um there was in the summer of 2019 there were two um shootings and one it was one in El Paso, El Paso. Texas and the other was Toledo is yes. that correct um, and there were 22 victims in one and nine in the other and at that moment in the year Carly who lives in New Hampshire this was what was in bloom this is what was she was seeing in her daily life as she's listening to the news of this horrific thing happening and so it's her idea of um, kind of a memorial, a memento, doing something that she could do in her world relating to this larger cultural phenomenon. Um, it takes this idea of a thing, you know, pressing um, flowers, mm -hmm. um, and she's done it on this massive scale. So it's really, I mean, something that is so beautiful and incredible about it is just like how technically beautiful these painted pieces are. So they're, they're painted on um, like mylar, duralar. Mm -hmm. And um, if you see them from far away, they look intensely photorealistic. I mean, it looks like you're looking at a photograph of um, pressed flowers. But when you get up close, they're kind of goopy and painty and delicious. Um, so they're just beautifully, beautifully made and they're really intricately cut. Um, yeah, they're amazing. Yeah. So Technically. I, I really love this piece so much and I love um, the symbolism, her bringing in the symbol with, again, kind of her own personal mm -hmm. take on, on a thing happening out in the world. Yeah. Okay, so now from here we're going to go talk about another piece of Susan Metricans, um, which are these four lovely, cheerful little fishes uh, called Side Mouth. I love this piece so much. It's like we were talking about she uses these symbols kind of nature home back and forth so it's got the sort of curtains and there's grommets kind of some kind of industrial man-made thing but then if you kind of take a step back they're goldfish <laughs> so i just love the playfulness of I it. i do too and they have this lovely little um red mouth underneath which i think just adds another layer to how 
how sweet and fun this is. And I'm sure there is some mystical thing about a goldfish, but I, I just, I just don't know. But yes, they are so fun. <laughs> and then also in this configuration, I really like how they become a window. They so. do become. A, I didn't even think about that. Yeah, I like that. And our last piece by Sachiko Akiyama is this amazing take on her migratory birds. Um, so Hannah, yeah. if you want to talk a little bit about this yeah. wonderful so the work. Piece, this piece as a whole is called The Great Migration. Um, and it is all these different migratory birds that do not normally flock together, wouldn't, wouldn't be together, but they're all flying in, as one in a single direction around the, the show. So they're sort of integrated in the whole show, um, flying over the top of it. Um, and I, I just love the symbolism of this. And to me, it's a real high point in this show, um, literally and figuratively, because birds, you know, they, they don't care what humans are calling them or what judgments are being made down here on the ground. They're just going to the place that is naturally home to them. Yes, it is definitely uplifting. Yeah. Okay, right. our last section is this way. Uh, this piece is by Leandra Lesseur. It's one of my favorite pieces in the show. Um, so I will, I'm going to talk about it and then you can say the title. Does okay. that sound good? So this piece um, Leandra made and it stems from a story um, kind of from her, uh, a formative year of her life. There was a quote that her mother kept on the family refrigerator when she was growing up. And if you would say the title. Sure. So the, uh, the title is Be Who You Is. And the quote that was on the refrigerator is, Be who you is, but not what you ain't. Because if you is what you ain't, you am what you not. So Leandra talks about how this was kind of a formative philosophy for her growing up. And she really loved it and had these warm feelings about it. Um, and on a prompt from an English teacher when she was in the 11th grade, she was asked to bring in a quote and they were gonna do a project about a quote that everybody brought to the classroom. So Leandra bought, brought this quote from her fridge that she'd grown up with and was beloved. And in getting to the classroom, the teacher um, rejected it and refused to talk about it on its merits because she deemed that it was not proper English. So I really, I just, I feel that this is such a powerful piece because she's kind of recontextualizing this really, really othering, awful experience and kind of turning it into a treasure box where it's a gift that people can take away. Yes, and this piece she created almost as a community piece. It's not for sale mm -hmm. and it's never been for sale. And she's installed it in Brooklyn um, outside and you can take the little card that has the quote on it. And same with this piece, I think it's a different iteration, but again, not for sale, but visitors are encouraged to take a card with them. So it's really interactive because you get to walk up and kind of discover the box yeah. and take one home with you. So Just nice. It's beautiful. Put it on your fridge. Yeah, put it on your fridge, <laughs> exactly. Um, so we'll talk about our last piece, which is by Hannah Cole. Yeah. Um, so this piece is called LOL, um, we'll get to why. This, um, this piece is actually a piece that I made during the pandemic, not that it's over just yet. Um, so I painted it in my tiny little laundry room. And I, although it doesn't have a weed in it, it has that sort of like urban quality. And um, it has this little element in it, this doll that's been dropped on the ground. Um, so it does kind of, I think the doll kind of does a lot to like orient you to the fact that you're looking at the ground. And yes, in a sense, it relates to say Christina's piece with this sort of thing that's been like discarded or sort of treated badly, fallen to the ground and is being um, walked over. But I do have a little more kind of hopeful insider quality to it where this doll in particular is an LOL doll. It's a kind of doll that's popular. If you have a young daughter, as I do, um, then you know about LOLs. And my daughter um, picked this piece out. So she sort of considers this to be her painting. And that is not a disregarded or <laughs> overlooked object. 
that is an object of supreme importance. And so to me, there's like kind of, although it's this like, you know, doll of color kind of dropped on the ground, actually in our household. And, um, you know, my youngest has this deep, uh, cherished relationship with it. And so it's sort of, um, to me, got this little hopeful side of like the, the next generation and what they can do. Excellent. Well, thank you for joining us on this walkthrough. Everything in the show you can find on our website. Um, most of it is for sale with prices ranging from $400 to $24,000. Um, you can also give us a call or shoot us an email for more information. Thank you. Um, very, really very interesting. And the way that the questions relating what's going on in our world or some issues mm -hmm. to what's going on in nature, I guess I was going, I was expecting to find a lot more environmental degradation much like the photographs that you showed early on. And yet this was a very different take. I found it to be very interesting. Um, right. I think we wanted to not, I mean, there's a lot of heavy work in the show. So we had to have nature as a counterpoint as well to bring beauty and um, harmony into it. Um, because like Hannah's premise, you know, there's no scientific basis on what a weed is. So, you know, we might, somebody might say a weed is bad, but somebody else might say, um, Queen Anne's lace is gorgeous. I, I was my favorite flower. So it's really perception um, to me. So when Hannah and I were talking about the show, I think including more uplifting pieces was important. Um, I, I gravitate to dark and I gravitate to heavy, but not everybody does. So <laughs> we wanted to include something beautiful as well. Well, I, I did uh, get a question. Yay. Awesome. <laughs> I've been very good at asking questions. And that question is, what medium is the flock of migratory birds? So those are all woodblock prints. Um, that Sachiko made of the different birds. And then she actually came to the gallery from New Hampshire and she cut out all of the birds with exacto knives and they wheat pasted them to the gallery walls. So they're easy to remove. Um, they're removable. Of course, they're one time use, <laughs> which is, it's going to be sad to see them peeled off the wall, but it's quite beautiful. So, what we're saying, what you're saying is that that's not a piece that she could resell or anything when she peels it off. She, she can, um, there it's sold by commission. So if somebody is like, I want this in my house on my wall for a long period of time, mm -hmm. then she would create the installation to specific to your home and then install it in that way. So it's sold via commission, but like this one, once it comes off the wall, it, it'll be destroyed. There's no salvaging it, basically. Yeah. I guess that's a form of degradation of beauty right there. That's true, too. There you it, go. That's true. <laughs> so, and I have a similar question about uh, the piece that's on the floor. Yeah. Um, how that was done and also... Is that something that someone would hang? What is the, is the idea of walking on and stomping down the flowers, is that part of this? I, I wouldn't walk on it. It is uh, $24,000, so you probably don't want to tread on it. <laughs> but, <laughs> but they are, um, they're hand painted. So it is on mylar and duralar. Yeah. And she's hand painted each one and hand cut them. So it is meant to be on the floor um, because it is supposed to be like pressed flowers in a, um, I guess you would have that in a photo album, right? So I think that the concept is to be on the floor. Uh, obviously, it would be hard to have this 
in your home unless you had a, a gallery space that you wouldn't walk on it. Um, it's hard getting people not to walk on it here. <laughs> it, um, but yeah, I, I don't think it's meant to be hung. It's meant to be viewed from above. So if you, uh, this sort of takes me back to my Ikebana experience. Mm -hmm. okay, so some of you all know that I am a, an advanced teacher of Ikebana, Japanese flower design. And there is a whole sort of um, style of uh, flower design, flower arranging, where you design looking down on something from above. Mm -hmm. Think of putting flowers on a coffee table for a party, for example. Right. Yeah. Um, that kind of a view which, you know, I look at that and I'm like, oh, I want to arrange those. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was, that's the fun part is we are, you know, Hannah and I created this layout. She just said, uh -huh. there's, you know, 21 morning glories and nine um, Queen Anne's layers. So we had fun kind of coming up with the layers of some underneath and the shape that we wanted we had to take in consideration people entering the gallery and look at the walls because, you know, too close to a wall, people will not look at it and step on it. So it's happened a few times, even yeah. with, please don't. <laughs> yeah. How does the gallery director market or sell a piece like that? I mean, I think this is an institutional piece. I think, you know, there's a lot of artwork that you can live with and there's a lot of artwork that is, really meant for an institution. Um, if you have a private museum, this is perfect. <laughs> you can put it in there. But there's some work that's hard to live with unless you are a really advanced collector that you would have a space in your home that would allow you to have this. Obviously, none of us have a space in our living room that we could put a piece of art on the floor that people wouldn't tread all over. So I think there's different types of art for different levels of of collector yeah well, our, our friend jean mclaughlin has asked if you would talk oh. more about her vision your vision or curatorial focus for the gallery in general um you know i'm i've evolved a lot since i opened obviously when I first opened, I, I really planned to be 100% photography. Um, and because that's where I worked for so many years was in the photographic art world. Um, and I soon realized that there was a, a plethora of amazing artists in this region um, and that I knew that I worked with in the past that didn't necessarily work in photographs. And I thought, I'm not stuck in the photo world anymore. I can do whatever I want. <laughs> so I've really tried to expand um, the gallery programming and bringing in painters um, like Hannah Cole and um, uh, our next show is w Luke Whitlatch, um, Rachel McGinnis, who paints on fabric and textile and utilizes old quilts, which her work is stunning. Um, for me, I would like to try to add more um, people of color. Um, so I'm really trying to diversify my program um, and add local people of color, um, minorities and such, as well as national and international. Um, I really try hard to keep a balance of national and local regional artists. So if I do have a local artist in the front gallery, in that little project space, I'll try to have a national artist small show. So I, I try to have that balance. So I focus on both. Um, I think it's important to for me to have a voice of a local regional artist and work about the region, which we've done a few times. So I hope that answered your question, Jean. <laughs> She'll type me back, I guess. <laughs> and I mean, I having watch these 10 shows and knowing all of these galleries fairly well with your being the exception. Um, I think that um, I've learned a lot and about the work of the curator. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think it's 
fascinating to be able to edit down to define a subject matter or a concept or a piece of work. And um, I found that to be very interesting. I've learned a lot through this process. Now, I have another question here mm -hmm. from my good friend Larry Schmidt in New Orleans. And actually, it's one that I, I think that Antoine's work is really fascinating. And he yeah, would like to know, is that on paper or canvas? How is that done? It is not. It is something called, it's acrylic on acrylic skin. So it is um, almost like um, almost like a fabric layer, but it's called acrylic skin. So he has a backing, and I think it's just layers and layers of acrylic paint with, um, as you can see, the thread and the other layers. This is a hard plastic layer that he's incorporated, but it is just multiple layers of acrylic paint that creates this very sort of malleable um, skin, as he calls it. So no, it's not on paper at all. Is, it, is that archival? I guess, I guess it is. You know, honestly, it's more archival than paper. Um, plastic will be around forever. So if you have an acrylic on canvas, I'm sure the acrylic will last longer than the canvas will. <laughs> well, the range of acrylics, I know it just in my studio right now, I. I I go to buy art supplies and I am totally blown away by yeah. the range of acrylics and what you can do with it is just fascinating. Yeah, it's amazing. It just is. Gold, it is. Golden alone, you could spend. <laughs> yeah. A lot I mean, of it's, money it's, it's, a, it's a great, it's a great um, paint for somebody who doesn't have uh, the time or the energy to use oil. I mean, oil is a process and you need ventilation and you need patience because it doesn't dry fast. But acrylic is really wonderful medium that way. Um, yeah. Well, that is really great. Um, and, and I agree with you about Rachel. I have a piece of Rachel's right there on my wall. Do you? Well, that's nice. She's amazing. I love her work and I love her new work even well, more, which is really Kevin. exciting. So, Jean. Yeah. Jean. Of course. <laughs> I, bet, I, bet, I bought it at one of the Penlin auctions. Wonderful. That's great. Yeah. So, um, any other responses from the peanut gallery out there? Well, I hope you feel like I do that you will come to Asheville and we will go to visit Tracy's gallery. I hope um, you do. I'm very anxious to get on your mailing list. Oh, I will put you on the mailing list. Don't you worry. <laughs> 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 and I look forward to seeing you sometime in person. It would be lovely to show you the space. And everything. Thank you. So. And to the people who are on with us today, um, We've had a really nice turnout considering that this is our last one. And I, I must say the work is fascinating and, uh, and I've totally enjoyed it. Um, and I, I'm kind of sad to close. So maybe I need to <laughs> shut up and turn this over to Bob. <laughs> um, this has been really a label of love. Bob and I are both volunteers. And uh, it, it has been very exciting. Uh, would anybody like to say anything about any of the programs just in general or in context? You know, I, I, we don't know post COVID uh, if, if this will be as valuable then as it is now. I, we suspect that a lot of things will continue to be virtual but we don't know. So um, we would love to get any feedback from any of you um, who've been visiting with us. Anything you'd like to add, say, subtract. Thank you very much for taking us to such great galleries. We would not have known about them and would have lost the last 10 months of exploring without yours and Bob's efforts. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much, Gwen and Elizabeth. Gwen. Um, 
Gwen is there with her mother, Elizabeth, who is a special story in and of herself. Would you like to say a few words about your mom? My mom is right here with me, and I am just so proud that she has taken me down a path that ex allows me to explore artwork. And she's a great artist in and of herself, and um, I, I can't say enough great about my mom. Well, if you all sign up for the uh, Shack blog, which comes out one, uh, once monthly, it is our intention to feature Elizabeth. Elizabeth is 90 plus years old and does the most beautiful work. So personal and detailed, uh, the ones I've seen are in watercolor. Um, but watch for Elizabeth on our, on our blog site. So. Um, Thank you. Thank you, Denise. Yeah, anything, anybody else out there? Well, um, I, I've always wanted to jump in. I just want to say thank you guys for organizing this. It has been fun to be able to go behind the scenes. And, you know, even though I may have visited all of these places, I did not necessarily have um, the, the curators and the directors and the owners that were speaking um, giving me that kind of personal trip. So you guys have done a, a wonderful COVID and non-COVID service. And I hope that you'll keep thinking of good programming because it sure is nice to be able to just stay at home and tune in. And I also want to say that Tracy just adds such a, a wonderful mix to the to the gallery scene. Um, she's introducing us to new artists. And I just, I mean, I really like the feeling of her space and the way that she's, um, you know, thinking about art and presenting it so thank you um, Jean. kudos thank you for <laughs> and thank for you <laughs> and thank I'm, you so much i am very excited about the photography that you're showing that has been in my opinion it's not that no photography has been shown in asheville but a lot of the galleries it, it's just not been stressed and i felt that it's been a little bit of a void mm -hmm. so i think that this is very exciting. And Bob might want to add to that. He is quite a photographer himself. Um, Bob, that's well, a good segue back to you. It, it is a good segue. Um, Tracy, thank you very much. That was, that was really thank lovely. Oh, thank you. I we wish all of you all a very, very happy and mostly healthy holiday and new year. May our new year be bright, full of joy and color and um, be a lot better than most of us have experienced in 2020. So um, Tracy, thanks again so much for Thank your you. presentation. Thanks for inviting me. It was really a, a pleasure. Thanks to Matt for some good videography there. Appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> So again, people, we will have the final uh, little text file with links to all of the galleries that you've seen that will go out after this presentation. So watch for that. And we will take uh, a few days, maybe a week here to compile all of these videos and then we will uh, send you links to them so you can review them and replay the parts that uh, went by too fast for you. Um, I would like to express my thanks to everybody who participated and everyone who tuned in to these. Um, this was a uh, scary undertaking uh, three weeks ago, and it feels a little more comfortable now. And I'm really pleased at how positively everyone has responded. Check out the, uh, the Sandhill Artist Collective website. Uh, feel free to join in on the commentary page, um, or if you have a news item for us, please give it to us, uh, comment on the work that uh, shows up in there. I'm sure that all of our artists and participants would really appreciate hearing uh, as much feedback as possible. So again, uh, happy holidays to everybody and thank you very much. Good night all. Bye. Good night. Good night.